The saxophone is one of the easiest instruments to play badly. Today we're going to talk about five things you may be doing that murder your own tone. Which reminds me, how did the saxophonist get caught for murder? They found ligature marks. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace. And if you're interested in saxophone masterclasses and product reviews, please do consider subscribing and hit the like button to save your saxophone's soul. Now today we're gonna to be talking about five things that could kill your tone and five things that could prevent that from happening. We're going to try to prevent saxophone homicide. Saxicide. Ooh, that sounds gross. Let's dive in and talk about the first thing that may be killing your tone. Strangulation or a tight embouchure. If I surveyed 100 saxophone teachers, which I have no intention of doing, I truly believe the most common answer for having a bad tone amongst their students would be a tight embouchure. It can go by several different names, pinching or biting, and certainly the lower jaw, too much pressure in a closed position is one of the main culprits. Symptoms include a small constricted sound with an accentuation of the higher partials and an attenuation of the fundamental in layman's terms, a bright, crappy sound. Now, in addition to too much jaw pressure, the lower jaw pushing up into the reed, it can be caused by a couple different things. General embouchure pressure, the lip and facial muscles of the embouchure coming into play, and also the angle of the mouthpiece going into the mouth. If the angle is too steep and you're pressing into the lower lip, that can cause the same problem. But fear not, there's an easy fix, exercise zero. Now, this is an exercise I developed to save the saxophone tone and my own sanity. I'm going to put a link down below. I have an entire video on it, and the exercises are free in our fundamentals book. If you follow that video, all the links you need are there. But essentially, what we're doing is just starting on low B-flat and climbing through the register while holding that relaxed, open embouchure. It's an exercise that I do immediately in the first lesson with a student. It's a great diagnostic tool. I can tell if their embouchure is too tight. I can check their playing position and the amount of air they're using. And I use it every lesson. Every time a student plays, I have it be the first thing that they play. And even in my own practice session. Amongst my private studio, my students at first hate it, then they question it, then they bargain with me, then there's acceptance. And believe it or not, eventually they all come to love it and start to sing the praises of this exercise, all coming back to the big low B flat, which requires a lot of air and a lot of relaxation to do this exercise correctly, prevents you from strangling your own tone. I'll put a link down to that video and the worksheets are in that video. Check it out and save your tone. Killer number two, asphyxiation. Picture this, you're on the bandstand getting ready to take a solo. You're thinking about the chord changes, the bass player. Ooh, a prominent saxophonist just walks into the club. There's a lot of things on your mind as your G sharp key sticking. You've got things on your mind and maybe the least of which is breath. Are you taking a big full breath? It's something we forget about, but we have to remember air is the critical component of a wind instrument. Obviously. So if we're not using enough air, there's no way we're gonna have a great tone, but it's something we often forget about myself included. So when we're about to perform, we can't consciously think, I need to take a big breath, or generally we don't because there's so much else on our mind, which means it needs to be an ingrained unconscious habit. So how do we make that happen? We practice it. So instead of putting a post-it note on your stand that says breathe, right next to the live, laugh, love post-it note that you have on there as that reminder as well, I like to do some practice tools where we unconsciously add breath to our practice. So get in the habit of when you start your metronome, maybe on two and four, if you're a swinging hep cat, one, a two, a one, two, three, four. Now as you're getting ready to play, you got your metronome going, you got your etude book in front of you, ready to play, think one, a two, a one, two, breathe and play. Say that with me, it's kind of fun. A one, a two, a one, two, breathe and play. So then when I'm playing, I'm thinking, mm, 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 mm. Mm. So we have to practice the breathing. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's something we need to do. If you use backing tracks that have the click, 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 think in your head. Click, 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 breathe and play. 
we have to practice breathing, we have to have a place for it to happen, do it regularly in your practice, then eventually it'll start sneaking its way into your performance. Not initially, but if you do it in your practice often enough, it'll happen that way. We had a saying in the army, we train as we fight, we fight as we train. And the army training did bear that out. So we have to practice breathing fully in our practice to have it any chance of it happening when we're performing. So one, a two, a one, two, breathe and play. Practice it. I think you're gonna like the results. Now, a couple of thoughts. How do you breathe? Do we need to take a giant masterclass on taking a breath? No, humans do it fairly naturally. This is a very powerful instrument. It is a very user-friendly instrument. Yes, we need to use a lot of air, but we naturally take in a lot of air with our large human lungs. So I don't think we need to go off the deep end with respiration therapy devices and strange little tricks that make it harder to blow where we do facial contortions. I think the natural breath we take when sighing or taking a nap is really gonna be about what we need. So what we need to make sure that happens is number one, think about it with the one, two, a one, two, breathe and play but also thinking relaxation. The greatest room for expansion of the lungs is downward. The diaphragm, which is controlled by unconscious muscles that we don't have direct control over, pulls downward as the lungs expand, which means the tummy pulls out. So if you're gonna think about anything when you're breathing, don't make weird facial contortions. Think about pulling the lungs downward, which means pulling the tummy out. Keep everything else relaxed. We need these intercostal muscles relaxed for expansion as well. Now, the forced exhalation, then we do tense those muscles. But we don't need to do anything strange to take a deep breath. We basically need to, one, think about it, and two, stay relaxed. Because if we're tensing our muscles and our tummy muscles, we don't have as much room for expansion for that big, beautiful breath. So don't kill your tone. Killer number three, falling down rabbit holes. Not happy with your tone? There's gotta be some quick trick that the pros use that I don't know about yet. Some awesome new embouchure hack that the cool YouTube kids are using that I just haven't figured out yet. So I don't like my tone, so I need to find the quick fix. All right, real talk, bring it in. Stop it, just stop it. Yes, there are outliers in the saxophone world, but we don't need to be chasing them. Sometimes on YouTube, you'll see something in a couple of videos, certainly not clickbait, I would never do such a thing. But they want you to get you to click on the video to find a quick fix to make your tone all better. But deep down, you know that's not true. The basic embouchure, as outlined by single read players for hundreds of years, works just beautifully. You don't need to do anything strange or jump off the deep end or do something with your lower lip that's gonna cause pain, confusion, and really not make your tone any better. Rolling an appropriate amount of lower lip over your bottom teeth is not the problem. It's not hurting your tone. And notice I said an appropriate amount of lower lip. No teacher worth their salt ever said roll too much lip over the teeth. Know what I mean? No, there's some outliers out there that are saying the problem is we're rolling too much lip. But no, I never said roll too much. I said roll a modest amount over your bottom teeth. Rest your top teeth on top. Use a normal single read embouchure. It's worked well for thousands and thousands of the world's greatest players. We don't need to chase these strange little things that are making trends every now and then. Tried and true. Now, once you can sing and fill a concert hall with a tone with a tried and true embouchure, if you want to experiment, super duper. But in the meantime, don't go falling down rabbit holes looking for a quick fix. You're gonna cause more harm than good. Killer number four. Sensory deprivation. You go into one of those little tanks filled with the salty water and you float while they play hippie music? Apparently that can kill you. If you have an underlying comorbidity, apparently it's happened a couple of times across the world. More likely, the danger is to our saxophone tone. And for me, sensory deprivation means not listening. I think the greatest danger we can have is the player you hear the most being yourself. Now, I don't mean that as an insult. It's partially insulting, granted. But what I mean is if you're watching me, the chances are you're a developing player. You're learning, which is why you're here. Unless you're just a really judgy expert that likes to watch with a smirk on your face, then hey, Larry, good to see you. But what I mean is we need to fill our ears, our hearts, our minds, and souls with players that inspire us. We need to have a crystal clear sound concept that we're shooting for. Otherwise, our practice time not completely wasted, but certainly not gonna be leveraged in the capacity that we could if we listened all the time, every spare moment, and had a crystal clear idea of what we want to sound like. And here's the good news, it's easy and it's fun. I like collecting records. I like sitting down 
and listening to one side of a record, roughly 15 or 20 minutes, uh, just have an active listening session with no other distractions. Because when it's on the computer, I have a tendency to get distracted. I'm human, it's the 21st century. You don't need to have a record collection, but you could create a playlist of your favorite players or ask a friend for a recommendation. And so when you get in your car, rather than putting on a podcast or a news show that's just gonna make you angry, anxious, and outraged, just put on a playlist of jazz. The school pickup line when I go to pick up my kids used to be a drag. It was a lot of time sitting in the car. Now I got Zoot Sims with me. Now it's a swinging session and it's as good as practicing, really. Killer number five, the most dangerous game, also known as the Hounds of Zaroff, a short story published in 1924 about hunting the most savvy, dangerous of prey. Man, about a dude that goes to an island and another dude hunts him. I mean, not ethical, but challenging, I assume. But let's not get too far off that beaten track. In, in the end, the hero actually ends up in the guy. Oh, spoilers, sorry. But anyway, hunting, the most dangerous game on the saxophone is the gear hunt. Hunting for that next piece of gear that's gonna fix your tone, open up your sound, give you that color you're looking for. Brother, it will not. Two big dangers when hunting for gear, number one, Time, the amount of time you spent scrolling the internet, looking at reviews, watching YouTube reviews of equipment, not my reviews, but other people's reviews, a time waster, obviously, and looking for equipment, ordering the equipment, getting the equipment in, finding the right ligature, then obviously you need to find the right reed pairing for that mouthpiece, so you then go on a hunt for the best reeds and then watch more review videos and read articles on the terrible forms. No, it's a huge time waster that you should spend, number one, listening to great players, which is gonna have a far bigger impact, and number two, practicing, emulating those great players. Chasing gear is a huge time waster. Number two, it introduces unnecessary variables. Progress on the saxophone takes consistency, time, and making small changes to our embouchure, our voicing. And if we're introducing other big variables like equipment with different chambers and baffles and reeds, it really can obscure the small changes we're making and making progress. We will have a change, but often it's not an improvement. So. Speaking of removing variables, I always encourage my students to have a synthetic read on hand that works because it removes a variable. So if they have a chirp or a squeak or the low notes responding, I remove the variables, aka the read. I have them put the synthetic read on, and if the problem works or the problem goes away, then we know it was the read. If the problem remains, we know it's something else. Most likely it's them, it's them, the player. So the fix is simple, medium mouthpiece, medium read, metal ligature that clamps the reed firmly on, maybe that's all you need. And if you can't get a beautiful sound on that, nothing else is gonna give you a beautiful sound, I can absolutely assure you. So those are my top five killers, but I need to know from you, how have you murdered your tone? What creative ways have you snuffed the life out of an otherwise beautiful saxophone tone? Or maybe you know someone, or a student, maybe you know someone else, intimately that's done that? Let me know in the comments below. How have you murdered your tone? Or how have you seen someone else murder their tone? Let's tell the nitty gritty stories down below. Hey, hope you have an absolutely fantastic day. Next week, we've got something a little different. Classical saxophone mouthpiece reviews. Now, why do I you need a classical saxophone mouthpiece? We're gonna talk about that. And I've got three recommendations I think you're gonna love. So I will see you very soon. In the meantime, go practice. And wipe off your fingerprints. <laughs>